Okay, so uh, welcome everybody back to the to our conference, uh, the second session. I'm Michael Burnack from this very faculty, uh, and we move from uh, truth to matter. Um, and in order to facilitate the discussion, I will briefly present each of our speakers um, very briefly, uh, pres presuming we know each other, uh, and then uh, so we can uh, delve directly into the matter. So um, our first speaker will be David Shaw, uh, our environmental law guy at, uh, here at uh, Tel Aviv uh, University at the law faculty. Uh, and the commentator uh, will be, um, uh, where, where is Miri? Miri, Miri Schaefer Mossenson, uh, who is the uh, chair of the Middle Eastern and African History Department, uh, somewhere over there in <laughs> one of those buildings over there. That will be our first uh, uh, paper. And um, the second paper will be by uh, Andreas Philopopoulos Michalopoulos. Is that correct? Cool. I was practicing. Yeah, I could say. <laughs> I could say. <laughs> uh, from the uh, University uh, of Westminster in London, where he is uh, director of the uh, Law and Theory uh, Center. And the commentator will be Professor Amnon Reichmann from the University of uh, Haifa. So uh, each of our speakers has uh, 15 minutes, and each of the commentators has 10 minutes. And in between, we will have 25 minute discussion, and then we will have the real matter, which is lunch somewhere over there. So, David, please. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for, uh, to the organizers for inviting me uh, to the conference. Um, the, this, so the, okay, so uh, my, this paper, uh, I feel a little bit like fish out of water at uh, a conference. My paper, as, you, as those of you who read it, uh, saw is not theoretical, it's not critical, it's more methodological um, in, in, in concern. And it also uh, begins from a very uh, positivist presumption uh, so related to the previous panel. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm presuming here that legal history, at least, wants to know the truth. Um, okay, so that, my paper is about uh, finding historical truth in a type of uh, historical source which is not uh, typically used in the subfield uh, that I work in, in environmental law. Um, and the genesis of the paper in my mind, um, I think in a way comes out of my discomfort. Often, it, well, in, the f in the few opportunities where I, where I publish things, I've sometimes been asked to uh, supply pictures, especially if you publish in historical um, places, like historical journals or collections, or whatever. People say, how about pictures? And you know, I have to, both out of my minimalist aesthetics as well as environmental <laughs> ethics, I often think, well, are, are pictures really justified here? What will a picture add to the arguments other than, at best, an illustration of a point, which was already made in words, um, and maybe not even that. Maybe it's just a tangential picture of something that was mentioned in the article. Is there really a justification for this picture? Um, and so I started thinking about, well, what actually real kind of historical justification, what kind of justifications can we give for using uh, pictures um, in the kind of histor legal hist historical work uh, that I'm doing. And so if those of you who read the paper um, saw there's a heavy emphasis in the paper as it currently exists um, on French Impressionists. Um, that's, that's not meant to be the subject uh, of the paper. That's just the way it sits right now. And I'm gonna, what I'd like to do today, among other things, is show you a lot of pictures of things that are not French Impressionism. Um, but I start with French Impressionists for, for several reasons. Um, so here, here's you know, this is also in the paper, uh, this painting by Monet, um, which, from which the Impressionist movement gets, got its name. A, a critic who didn't like this picture um, sort of laughed at the fact that it was you know, called Impression. It's just an impression. Um, and um, one of the places where my ideas for this paper started to gel was an exhibition I was at in Denver, uh, Denver Art Museum this year. They got a big donation of a private collection of Impressionist paintings, and they put on this big exhibition called Nature as Muse uh, of Impressionist Landscapes. And a quote from, you know, from, the, from the written material that came with the exhibition was, for instance, their vision of nature was often one of peaceful idleness. And I think that's, that's the way all, people often think about the French, imp French Impressionists. Many of us, I think, try not to think about the French Impressionists <laughs> as this sort of saccharine, middle-brow, pretty uh, image, not for serious people. Um, when you actually start looking at the, the, a lot of the paintings, besides the fact that you know they are pretty, they are gorgeous, um, <laughs> there's a lot more going on in them than sort of depictions of peaceful nature or of, or of leisure. Um, so this picture of impression sun rising 
is actually, when you look at it, it's a picture of air pollution. Uh, you know, on the left, there's the smoking chimneys, uh, and the whole sky is actually covered with polluted air. And when you start looking at the Impressionist paintings with slightly different eyes, uh, you see that they painted an awful lot of, of pollution. So just a few examples. There's more in the paper. Um, houses of Parliament, effect, this is called Houses of Parliament, effect of fog. Now, you know, many of us have been to London many times, and you don't see that fog that you read about all the time. I mean, yeah, they do have some foggy days, like most places, but where did the fog go? Well, it turns out the fog was not really fog. The fog was air pollution. Um, so that, and here's the other one, which is in the paper. This is Houses of Parliament, effect of sunlight. Right, not a big difference uh, between those. Now, I, Monet is interested in this picture, I believe, in the effect of sunlight, um, but what he's actually painting besides the effect of sunlight is also the effect of really horrible air pollution. Um, and there's, he has, there's many, many paintings by, Mon by Monet of London in particular and air pollution. So here's one of many of a series he did uh, of Waterloo Bridge. Here's another one. There's, there's more, many more paintings of the Houses of Parliament, of Charing Cross Bridge, um, and other sites uh, in London. Here's a painting um, which uh, boats more to Le Petit uh, Jean of Villiers, um, an idyllic painting at first sight, but again, look in the background, you know, ruining the sort of idyllic landscape are these smoking <coughs> smokestacks in the back, which also seem to be echoing uh, the masts on the boat. Um, here's one which is, which is not in the paper, but um, maybe should have been the goods train. Uh, besides the train here, which is belching steam and, and maybe smoke as well, uh, if you, I mean, if you can make it out, in the background is this horrible, wasted industrial landscape. Um, many, many uh, factories, chimneys, uh, and sort of um, general scene of what seems to me to be uh, desolation. Here's one which is in the paper. Uh, now moving on to another uh, by uh, Kaya Bota, Factories at Argentoy. I, I, in the paper, I show three pictures of the same site, each looking very different. This is the third, chronologically speaking, uh, in the series he did. Um, this is, the, this is the, the pleasure site, which so many Impressionists painted. And most of them also actually painted in the, the, the industrial uh, site aspects of the site. Here's one which focuses uh, very clearly on it. Um, here's one which is in the paper. Uh, Raoul Dufy, this is very different than most Dufy paintings that we're used to looking at, you know, both in the palette and the subject matter. Uh, this is er relatively early on in his career. Uh, you know, this, this to me looks like, you know, very politically aware, socially aware. Uh, criticism uh, of, in of industrialization and its effect, you know, you know it's and its effect on the working class, right? This is not just a picture of environmental desolation, it's also um, of the social costs of in industrialization. Uh, Gauguin, you know, we don't, this is not Tahiti, this is Paris, um, or the outskirts of Paris, and, and this is one of several paintings he did of uh, areas around Paris. Um, another, another Impressionist painter, uh, uh, Guillaume Sunset at Ivry, which was an industrial site, again, right outside Paris, in the southeast of Paris. Um, and a few by Van Gogh. Van Gogh has actually a bunch of paintings of industrial sites. So here's also outskirts of Paris factories at uh, Clichy, uh, you know, which you might know, which I think is one of the end stops on one of the train, mm -hmm. commuter trains there, right? And uh, this is uh, outskirts of uh, Paris near Montmartre. Again, Paris here. Look at the, the pall of smoke uh, hanging over the city. Right. So this is this is widespread not only among impressionists and post-impressionists, but among painters from other places uh, in this uh, rough period. Um, and my point here is not just this is the this is the thickest part of the paper and also my presentation today because there's so much material. And so the point here is not only a legal one. I think you know you could just do a general sort of cultural history of of pollution uh, using these sources. Uh, what I'm trying to get out of the sources from the legal point of view is trying to understand the cultural background to the development of environmental law. And one thing I think you can take away uh, from these paintings, um, as I talk about in the paper, is at least an, is an ambivalence about pollution, which, sometimes, which cuts both ways, depending on which painting you're looking at and which particular painting. Uh, sometimes there seems to be um, an aestheticization of pollution. Uh, look how beautiful it is, as in some of the Monet's. Uh, sometimes, as certainly in the Dufy painting, but in others as well, there seems to be uh, more of a, you know, of a recognition of the the, the downside of pollution, um, and I think that explains or might help explain some of the ambivalence in the law at this period as well. Um, okay, now moving on to uh, low art. Um, there's this whole genre of promotional literature 
uh, late 19th century, great industries of Great Britain, there's one for the US, and you know, everyone has their great industries books, um, with these sort of hellish visions almost, I think, of, of their great industries. Um, you know, this is just one example from inside that book. There's many of these kind of uh, uh, lithographs, I guess they are. Um, they're, despite the fact, I mean, to my eye, these places look like horrible places you would never want to see. Um, they're being clearly, this is in promotional letters, right? So they're looking at this and seeing it very different the way, from the way I'm looking at it. They're saying, look how great uh, Great Britain is. Um, this one, I'm not sure what, the, what, what to make of it. Uh, this is this place, uh, Witness, you know, which is in, near Manchester. There's lots of photos and pictures of this place. I, I can't tell if this is a joke or if this is, uh, or if this is serious. Um, this is clearly this is clearly someone who's proud of the pollution he's producing. This is the, a letterhead of a I don't know what it is an accounting book maybe um, where you know the the ironworks puts a picture of itself polluting on their promotional literature. I mean, just try to imagine any kind of industrial corporation today uh, doing something like that. Um, here are ads by uh, there's, <laughs> if you look on internet you find a lot of these of American brewing companies from the late 19th century. So also it's interesting to note Schlitz Brewery uh, actually had a lot of different kinds of artisanal beers at the time, um, as did Pabst. Um, and Milwaukee, again, looks like not a great place. I mean, maybe, maybe not as bad as Madison, but uh, how do you like it? But, but, uh, this, so, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, right, so again, these companies are very proud of the, of the way, of the way not necessarily the pollution itself, but the pollution is a sign of something else which they're proud of. Um, okay, now moving on, no way, now moving on to another, another uh, genre completely, um, which I'm very into, is uh, early and mid 20th Selfie. century posters. Hmm? Selfie. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, here's, a, here's a 1907 uh, Austrian poster extol uh, extolling the, uh, you know, the great inventions uh, being shown at an exhibition. Uh, here is a company which is still around uh, that produces uh, colored inks. Um, again, it's hard to imagine someone promoting themselves like this today. Um, here, okay, so here, this is, this is uh, political, and this is a great piece, 1921 um, plebiscite of, the, of Upper Silesia. Would it be part of Poland? Would it be part of Germany? So this, uh, there was a lot of paramilitary groups involved in this, part of like the general chaos of, of post-war Weimar. And so here, the, right, the prayer of the homeland is that, is that Upper Silesia should remain German, and the cross here is clearly echoed by these smoking uh, factories, which is what Upper Silesia meant to people. Right? Upper Silesia was an industrial region, and they're so proud of it, uh, of the pollution they produce, that it gets compared to the cross. Uh, here's a, a Dutch poster from around the same time for another, for an, ex an exhibition, uh, which they're, they're very proud of their, their pollution. Uh, this is one of my favorites. The Art Deco movement got its start in 1925. Um, Ex exposition in Paris of decorative arts, and this is uh, like one of the two main uh, pa posters for uh, for the for the exposition. Again, we see here about, you know the aestheticization of pollution. Pollution is associated with, with progress, uh, with modernity. It doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, this is by Cassandra, one of the famous poster designers of the period. Um, again, smoke is something to be proud of. Here's an American poster. Uh, the streamlined train, which is clearly a symbol of modernity, um, <laughs> sort of being crushed by these giant, uh, I don't know what it is, refineries or something. Um, occupations related to industrial arts. This, uh, this is already a WPA poster, uh, so it's a little bit later, late 30s. For some local color, uh, there's a lot of these. Uh, the labor movement uh, election poster here from probably around 1930, glorifying in its, uh, their, you know, the pollution they're producing. Uh, here, this is something which is related to us. where pe people were asked to sign this pledge to only buy local, meaning local and Jewish um, products, um, and the symbol of that, which people were also like asked to post in their place of business or home, was the smoking factories. Um, and here, here's okay. Here's here's another uh, here's another one. There's lots of these. This is a recruitment poster from World War II. Part of the Jewish homeland here, in the top left, again, is the smoking factories. This is from a bit later, from 1959. Uh, this is the uh, conservative right-wing parties, labor movements. I, I like the way the guy's sort of looking at the pollution 
uh, and a sh with a shocked look on his face. But I think it's I think he's supposed to be looking impressed. Uh, he's a bit like the Monopoly guy as well, <laughs> like his legs. <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorites that I just found on the, on the internet. This seems to be directed at Jewish uh, DPs, refugees in Europe after World War II, saying, don't go to America, go to Palestine. Um, and, it's, and what it says in Yiddish is, we basically, uh, we do, don't forget what it means to go to the, into exile, go back, go back home. And so their picture of America uh, is, again, is this, is this horrible smoke. Uh, it, well, here, here it clearly has a negative connotation. Right? That, that's why it's interesting to me, because as opposed to the general Zionist um, and labor valorization of pollution as being a symbol of progress, here the American pollution, at least, um, is being contrasted with this you know, bucolic Palestine. Um, so here we're moving into a different period. Again, this is, this is WPA art, late 1930s, uh, smoke over Des Moines. Here, smoke already is recognized as something bad. Um, there's a whole, there's a whole, <coughs> into posters, something called Mather Work Incentive Posters, which were these corporate, uh, like, tools to, like, get your workers to work better and more efficiently and all kinds of stuff. So here, this poster clearly is associating pollution uh, with bad stuff, right? So let's clear the air. And here's another one by them. Uh, here comes the peddler of discontent with pollution again being uh, associ associated with all kinds of negative things. Um, and I, if, this is also, these are Mather work incentive posts from 1920s. Um, and if you think this looks anti Semitic, which I do, um, here's an explicitly anti Semitic poster from Vichy France um, about how American industry is controlled by Jews. Um, and again, here, you know, maybe this is the particular, uh, you know, reactionary politics of Vichy France, but, but uh, pollution is something terrible here. Um, here's, here's the socialists in uh, revolutionary Spain. Uh, this is, you see in a lot of posters actually, right, the comparison of smoking smokestacks to weaponry. Uh, so in wartime, at least for some people, pollution is a symbol of strength. Uh, here's an American take on the same theme. Uh, here's, here's a Canadian cartoon, which seems to be on the same thing, but also at the same time undercuts itself, because the smoke, Canadian munitions and supplies for the Allies belching smoke, and then in the background, Allies attack on Germany, so the smoke is clearly echoing the smoke. Um, and I think the smoke in the foreground is supposed to be a good thing, and the smoke in the bad in the background is, is destruction, and so the artist maybe is undercutting himself without realizing it. There's a, there's a whole genre of conservation posters from World War II, or this one's actually from World War I. Um, light, cons light, cons light consumes coal, save light. Uh, so sorry, save coal. Here's to conserve water, but again, juxtaposed uh, with pollution being a good thing. Um, now, I, I think I mentioned this in the abstract, didn't get to it in the paper. The modern environmental law um, is often credited, uh, the credit for it often goes to several works of art, uh, which is, okay, so here we're moving on to like a different way of not just the cultural background. For, for law, but art as actually producing law in some way. So Silent Spring is one thing that's always talked about, Rachel Carson's book. The famous photos of the Earth from Apollo 8. First time they photoed Earth from somewhere else. It's not from moon orbit, um, which made people think about the environment in a whole new way, supposedly. The Santa Barbara oil spill of 1969, whose pictures shocked America, and the Cuyahoga River on fire in 1969 which also shocked America. So these are all works of art which are supposed to have uh, tran transformed uh, legal consciousness. All right, I'm going to just skip ahead because I'm running out of time. Um, so here, so this, the second thing I talk about in the paper is, or actually I ran out of time. So if, if the organizers want me to stop, just let me know. Um, the, uh, he, here's, okay. Uh, so here's, here's why I talk about whether art can be uh, whether art can show us the results of law. So Northwest Ordinance and the laws that come after it are, you know, are famously radically affect the American landscape. So here's an example. You can, I think you can see that visually very well. 1969, uh, New York City zoning law, which changed the way uh, New York looked. Um, and then here's, here's something about the 1961 uh, zoning law in New York, which basically made Sixth Avenue possible with all its plaza, plazas, which has gotten a lot of, which got a lot of criticism afterwards. People feel like Sixth Avenue is a horrible urban avenue because of all these plazas. Um, but here's another case where actually art influenced law, right? The inspiration for the 1961 zoning law was, was the Seagram building, which was viewed as a great success. And now why Seagram building is a success and Sixth Avenue is viewed by urbanists as a failure is a whole other question. Uh, but anyway, loss in here seems to affect art, and art, uh, and also Le Corbusier, of course. Le Corbusier's 
vision, artistic visions, clearly affected law in this case as well. And here's just a picture of Levittown, another case where I think you can see art, in this case a photograph, uh, almost abstract qualities. It helps you understand what law has done to the American landscape, you know, better than a thousand words. This is, here's the methodological question of what we consider art moving into journalism here. Is journalism art or not? Or, it's just, or is it a standard uh, so, you know, historical source? So here's what the St. Louis newspaper actually does its own before and after uh, analysis of a, of a local smoke ordinance. So the picture on the left before, picture on the right after. Same thing here uh, in St. Louis. And there are similar things for Pittsburgh and places like that where the pollution was really bad. And at some point, they managed to clean up the air. Uh, and then the last part of the paper, uh, I talk about sort of using law to actually discover unknown, start using art to discover unknown environmental law. <coughs> so one thing is if you look at early paintings like this early 19th century one that was seen in England, this is a uh, German scene in the 1840s, you notice the short smokestacks. And then when you get to the later pictures like Pizarro, Pizarro's elegant smokestacks, uh, he, he has this obsession with these very tall smokestacks in Paris and in, in Rouen, um, which, which uh, besides you know whatever other associations you want to make with it, uh, I think there's a legal development behind this as well. Law is pushing factory owners to build higher smokestacks for various kinds of reasons. And while the art doesn't tell us why they did that, it at least raises the question. Uh, so that's why I'm going to use the art here to sort of raise questions for historical, legal historical analysis. And I'm ending here. Let me that right. Um, and then also I talk about in the paper these Monet's, back to Monet again, the paintings um, of uh, the beach at Trouville. And I think, you know, uh, you know, I may be reading too much into this, but I think you see in these paintings, here's another one you see that there's a set building line here um, on the beach. And now, and th this despite right, what I call, you know, what game theory calls, you know, th the incentives to defect here. Right? Even if people realize that, that it made sense for everyone to not build right up to the water line, because this way you have a beach, people can walk on, you'll get more tourists, the incentives for any one landowner, I think, to go out further on the beach would be very high. Um, and yet they don't do it, which to me indicates there may be some legal restraints here. And whether that's private law or public law and what form of law, uh, I don't know, but again, it raises the question. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay, so just, that's, I'll finish right here. I, I, I just wanted to apologize. In the, in the abstract, I talked about Joseph Roth's uh, Hotel Savoy. I could not find the quote I was looking for afterwards in Hotel Savoy. I, just, I went back and read the book three times. I could not find it. Um, so if anyone, and it may be in another Joseph Roth book, if anyone can remember where in Joseph Roth uh, he talks about uh, the police enforcing, enforcing pollution laws. I thought it was Hotel Seva because that's a book which has a ton of pollution in it. Uh, but if anyone knows the answer to that, uh, please let me know because I couldn't find it. So I apologize for those of you who are looking forward to uh, Joseph Roth. Mm -hmm. Sorry for going over time. Thank you.